no um, reason why you had to Good morning, everybody. Morning. <laughs> what are your questions about the topics? Uh, yeah, so uh, I didn't, I mean, I didn't do any class because the book has just got me great this morning, but like finding, like, given a temperature in Fahrenheit, what is it in Celsius? Given a temperature in Kelvin, what is it in Fahrenheit? Like being able to convert between them. Um, the other thing about temperature scales is calculations of delta temperatures. So what is the difference in temperature? So like between Celsius and Kelvin, the delta temperatures are always the same because they are. A degree Kelvin and a degree Celsius are the exactly the same distance on the scale. It's just argued about where zero is. But a degree Fahrenheit is much smaller than a degree Celsius. There's a 180 divisions between the freezing and boiling of water on the Fahrenheit scale, whereas there's only 100 divisions on the Celsius. And can you translate back and forth between the scales? Right? Whether they're absolute temperatures or delta temperatures. Is it playing around with those conversions? What is it like? I don't know. Five ninths times the temperature and whatever. Plus thirty two. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I believe I gave you a homework problem. I think that had some something to do with that. You had a, you had a temperature difference in Fahrenheit or Kelvin or something. And you had to find the temperature. Difference. No. It wasn't Fahrenheit. To anything. I didn't see any Fahrenheit. Okay. Maybe that was it. I remember there being something about there. And honestly, I threw that on there because I was hoping it would be an easy question for you. There was one in 20. It was like, it said C. It would have been in chapter 18. No, it said like C and then degrees. Yeah. C unit. Yeah. But it wanted the answer Right. Yeah. Temperature scale. <laughs> There's only one temperature scale to rule them all. Yeah. See, wouldn't it be cool to have all the te weather forecasts be like, tomorrow it's going to be 293 Kelvin. <laughs> what is C degrees? So there is a degree Celsius and Celsius degrees. <laughs> so when degrees come second, you're always referring to the absolute number, like what is the temperature? Whereas if you say degrees Celsius, I can go I can have a five degree Celsius change. Right? I can go from 30 Celsius to 35 Celsius. That's a degree Celsius change. Whereas 35 would be Celsius degrees. I don't make the rules for this. Thermodynamics is dumb. No. But real, but like if I'm asking about a delta, right? But it doesn't matter what the actual temperature is, it's the change that's taking place. Other questions about the topics? The laws of thermodynamics. So laws of thermodynamics, conceptual times two, is that the one? So what laws of thermodynamics do you know? First, second, and zero it. I did teach you about the zero it. Right? OK. Which is, again, kind of stupid. But laws of thermodynamics are basically conservation of energy, and then the entropy, efficiency, heat always flowing from one direction to the other. Um, in nature, things can't spontaneously start happening without energy inputs. You can't like have purely reversible processes. Um, that, that's in the book. Um, so, the, but that, that's what I mean by the laws of thermodynamics. Right, all the concepts surrounding these. Ideas about work being done, heat going in and out of things. Um, yeah, so two co co purely conceptual questions about laws of thermodynamics. Do we need to know the laws of No, as long as you know that there's one that has to do with basically the definition of temperature and equilibrium, one that has to do with the conservation of energy, and one that has to do with entropy and heat. You know, that heat naturally flows in hot to cold. 
No, that's just the laws of thermodynamics. Okay, is there going to be... So then, then there's a question about thermodynamic processes conceptual, which is a question about like what happens in an isothermal process, right? Or, or a constant volume process. Like how do you know when it's these things? Um, yeah, there's like four. Adiabats, same temperature, same pressure, same volume. And, I, and I'm not going to expect you to, I'm not going to drop like isochoric on the exam, right? Like, I, come up to me, Mr. Bailey, what does isochoric mean? I'll just tell you. Right? Like, I'm not testing you on terminology. Yeah. For the thermodynamic process, is there Yeah, re relative usefulness, right? We talked about that. I mean, in terms of um, relative to each other, like you know how you have the stack in terms mm -hmm. of um, more entropy or less. Yeah, the ones towards the top or least entropy, the ones towards the field. What's the one that loses? It's always a lot. Thermal energy, right? Way down there at the top. Um, yeah. What does two questions on efficiency mean? Not efficient. <laughs> it could be one refrigerator, one, one uh, engine, right? Heat pump. Um, it could be a question about maximum efficiency as opposed to actual efficiency. So when it says maximum efficiency, what do you know? Um, it's the Carnot efficiency, right? So, otherwise, it's always a question of uh, what you want divided by what you pay for. So coefficient of performance is a measure of efficiency. Oh. It's just we tend to use efficiency when we're talking about an engine and coefficient of performance when we're talking about a refrigerator or a heat pump. Oh. That's 75% true. In what context? Like, when is it positive and when is it negative? In what context? <laughs> so, when it comes to thermodynamic processes, the things we studied in chapter 18 and 19, it's very specific. And when a thermodynamic process, like isothermal or same volume, same pressure, adiabatic, the system, the thermodynamic system, what picture do you get in your head? Cylinder with the piston with the gas inside, right? Work is positive when that piston goes up. When work is done on the surroundings by the piston, then the work is positive. If that piston goes down or the surroundings does work to push it down, that's negative work. It's the opposite of chemistry. It's the exact opposite of chemistry. So the other answer to your question is, when is work positive or negative when it comes to heat engines or refrigerators? Remember, I kept drawing absolute value signs around everything, right? The reason being is that, say, for an engine, right, it's, it's you look at the direction of energy flow, right? In the case of an engine, QL, the exhaust side, is heat that is lost, and so that gets a, it's a difference between that, so the work plus the hot is the exhaust, right? But in the case of refrigerator, it's a little bit reversed, you need to take a difference, the work that come, the work that you put in causes this difference, QH minus QL. So we don't really talk about whether or not, like, the actual work is positive or negative, we talk about what What's the important, what are we adding together? What are we taking the difference between? And then we can say overall the work is positive or negative, or the QL is positive or negative. I know that's a little bit confusing, but when it comes to the second law of thermodynamics, you're looking at that schematic of the engine, right? And where are all the energy flows going? So in the case of a Specific system and a thermodynamic process, it's very clearly spelled out what the Q's and what the W's are. In engines, it's also clearly spelled out, but it's different depending on if it's an engine or a refrigerator.
Are we going to have to know how pressure changes when you go farther underwater? Yeah. Oh, but like, 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 do you need to know rho g is like that homework problem? No. So that would be convection, conduction, or radiation. Okay. We covered those conceptually in class. Give me an example of um, conduction. Feet on the floor. Nice. Still top, right. Oh, like, to, to, well, any stove top actually is conduction, whether it's gas or electric or magnetic or anything else. Uh, what about, um, give me an example of convection. Uh, water. So the, so the air, onshore, offshore breeze, in the mantle, in boiling water, and any, anything where you've got like a hot side and the cold side and stuff is moving around because of changes in density, right? Con Convection is all about transferring thermal energy by moving molecules around. And then give me an example of radiation. The sun, <laughs> microwave. Okay. Um, light, infrared, heating. I suppose you could argue that an electric stove top could be like infrared because they're, if you've got the kind with the elements inside and then there's glass over the top, you're not in direct contact, but you are sort of. Exception to that, you right? The harder we human beings try to characterize the universe, the more exceptions we come up with. To tell you something about how we're thinking about how the universe works. Other questions? Homework? About life? <laughs> Did you see the new avatar? I've not seen the new avatar. It's avatar. I don't plan to see the new avatar until it comes out for free on Disney Plus. <laughs> But I, ever since the pandemic, I'm like, why am I going to a movie? Watch it at home. I enjoy it at home. There's nobody chewing popcorn in my ear. Well, I find the concept of movie theaters, they're normalized, but they're not normalized. We sit with a bunch of strangers in a very Yeah. Because, because it's the experience of experiencing it together. That's exactly what it is. That's why you go to the end. You you hear about AMC is going to start charging, like for like airline seating, or where you're sitting in the theater. So, yeah. So if you're sitting on an edge, they're going to charge less than if you're sitting middle. No, it's more expensive for for the better seat. I actually like, like it. Yeah, like a football stadium or a theater. I like sitting in a music hall and just being like, I don't know. All right, we're off topic, but that's okay. It's thermodynamics. Can we talk about the Mandalorian? Now, what are your questions about the topic? Yeah. Number one on chapter 20. 20, number one. Now I'm in a panic because I did not check this morning. Any of these things. Is it this one? Yeah. All right. Four engines. Oh, and they've given me, oh, they gave me the, the temperature of the reservoirs. That's interesting. And then... They give me for a complete cycle. Oh, okay. 
So now they're talking about the first and second laws of thermodynamics. And if there's been a violation, uh, what do you want to tackle first, first or second law? Yes. First law? Okay. So the first law tells me for an engine that the amount of heat that is spent and work that comes out has to be equal to the like exhaust. Like we need to conserve energy, right? So I'm looking at these numbers. And if I have 200 joules of energy in my hot side, and 175 joules are exhaust, how much work could I get out of this engine? Only 25, right? Conservation of energy demands that the amount of work be the difference between the, the hot and the cold side. They're telling me it's 40 joules out. So did we violate the first law of thermodynamics? Yeah. Absolutely. All right. So the rest of them, we should be able to very quickly see what's going on, right? Engine B, violate or not? Yeah. Total violation. I don't know what they're smoking there, right? OK. C, ah, no, that one didn't violate it, right? Because. We started with 600, we lost 200, the difference is 400, and they're telling me that that's the work. So that one works. And then D, D is also okay, right? So neither, so, so A violated the first. So of the first and second laws, which, if either, does each engine violate? That was a very um, awkward English phrasing of a question. If they both fail, or if one fails, then it fails altogether, right? So I would already be saying A and B definitely violate, right? So I didn't look and see what. Ah! Okay, well, okay, so I've got to check everything. I was hoping that I could just say it violated and I'd be done, okay? So. Uh, we know that A and B violates. We gotta keep track here. There's no way I'm gonna be able to hold this all. So what? So A violates what? First, first. B violates first. C and D no violations yet, right? Okay. So what about the second law of thermodynamics? What should the? How are we gonna be able to tell if the second law of thermodynamics is being um, violated? They told me something about this engine. Are all the engines, right? We know the hot temperature and the low temperature, right? And so I know something about the efficiency based on the temperatures. What could I find out about the efficiency knowing the temperature? Maximum. I could figure out the maximum theoretical efficiency of this engine. All four engines, because they're all the same. It's one minus, what is it, T low over T high? So that's one minus uh, the low temperature, 300, all over 400. They even gave it to me in Kelvin, so I don't have to convert, right? So it's one minus three quarters, which is what? So 0.25, right? So that means if any of these engines have an efficiency higher than that, I know that this inventor is smoking dope or trying to pull a fast one, right? So definitely try to pull a fast one on A and B because it's impossible. You can't violate conservation of energy. But let's see what's happening. Okay, so what's another way I could calculate efficiency for an engine? In general, what is efficiency? It's what you want. So for an engine, what do we want? Work. Work. And what do we pay? QH. Right? QH represents the energy that goes into the engine. Okay, so for number one, uh, the work is 40 and the QH is 200. Oh, sorry, for A. Right? So 40 over 200 is um, 0.2? 0.2? 0.2? 0.2? 0.2? 0.2? 0.2? 0.2? 0.2? 0.2? 0.2? 0.2? 0.2? 0.2? 0.2? 0.2? 0.2? 0.2? 0.2? 0.
500, so that's four fifths. 0.8. So does that one violate the? Okay, so first and second law for that one, right? What about C? Uh, 400 over 600, 2 thirds, which is 0.66, right? And then for D? 10 over 100, point 0.1, that one's okay, isn't it? So it looks like uh, D is the only engine that uh, I'd uh, buy if I needed to buy it. So let's see here. What did, what did we say? We said that the, it was the first law. We said that was the both. C was the second, and D was neither. Victory dance. Oh, new one? Any other questions on this one? This homer? Yeah. Oh, coefficient of performance. All right. <laughs> if the heat pump is a Carnot engine working in reverse. Okay, would you just play, just say heat pump. Seriously. Okay, so now I've got to look up uh, equations for my notes. Because there's, there's no hope of me ever working through without having my notes in front of me. See? Coefficient. So, what do we know about coefficient of performance when it comes to heat pumps? And notes on this one. Coefficient of performance. Q over the work. But it says it's a heat pump, right? Okay, so it's not cute. That, that's coefficient of performance for a refrigerator. Yeah, the thing that's throwing me and the thing that's starting to worry me is the Carnot engine working in reverse. So they want it to be a heat pump or do they want it to be a Carnot refrigerator? It is. It's a poorly written question. Just get rid of it? I think it, it, it says it's a heat pump. It did say it's a heat pump twice. What did they give me? It delivers that much heat to the building. Every hour. They're asking for a rate of work, so what are they asking for? Power. They're asking for water. They're asking for power. Energy per time, right? So, coefficient. The coefficient of performance is what we want versus what we pay, right? What we want is that heat delivered. As I'm as I'm reading it, right? What we want is 5.26 megajoules of energy delivered to this system. Mega, not milli. Megajoules. Okay. What are we paying? We're paying work. Right? Okay. 
So if I want the work done, I take the 5.26 times 10 to the 6 joules and I divide by uh, my coefficient of performance. But I have a feeling that's not what they want. You do Q cold over work and then you solve for work with like the QH minus Q. Yeah, it's the. I solved it, but uh, so no, I, I think I, I think I know what they want you to do, but from the phrasing of their question. <laughs> well, I just might actually. So I bet you more than anything, if I go check the key right now, it's going to say QL over the work, not Q hot over the work. Right. That's the problem. The coefficient of performance for a fridge that I gave you and that your book gave you is Q low over the work because you want cooling to happen, right? The, the thing you're after. But the coefficient of performance for a heat pump that's given by your book and that I gave you in class, okay, for a heat pump is QH over the work. And, and the problem I'm running into is the vague nature of how they asked the question. It was so clear in my mind when I assigned it, but now I'm doubting. Do they, do they mean, so they do say, the heat pump is a Carnot engine working in reverse. Well, that would be work divided by QH. So, I'm going to look at the key. It's too vague. And I bet you more than anything they wanted you to do it the hard way. Well, no, I think I'm just going to give you the answer. <laughs> it's, easier than, it's easier to do it that way than it is for me to go in and, like, Wiley Plus gets really upset if you guys have done assign, like anything on the assignment and I start removing problems. It's, it, we've had trouble in the past with Wiley Plus communicating with campus. Uh, which one was this one? This one, right? Okay. So it's going to be different for everybody. So, yeah, they didn't ask the question correctly. Um, because they say it's being used to heat a building. So, yeah, they didn't ask this right. If they, if they wanted to ask this one correctly, they should have said um, they're cooling the building or something like that. They, they should. They tied themselves in knots in the question, so I apologize for that. I thought it was going to be much more straightforward than it turned out to be. So let me capture this. This will be on the PDF. There we go. It's on the PDF. Um, and uh, do, just do that. Do, do, no, I'm not going to do that. I mean, am I going to ask you about refrigerators and heat pumps? Sure, but I'll be very clear. Right? And no. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Right? And you'll know. I'll go like, oh my gosh. Right. I, I did do the key up, and I don't remember on the key running into any kind of confusion, right? Number one was being asked. So maybe I did the key up. That's happened before. But I could, I could just tell, right? That is the coefficient of performance for a refrigerator. But how am I supposed to know that this is a refrigerator when they told me they're heating a building and to do a heat engine in reverse? I have one more topic I'd like to go over. Okay. The view of like breaking down ice with the coffee. Oh, late, late in water. Heat. Yeah. What about it? Just like how to set it up again. <laughs> This is one of those things that 
after 23 years, I still don't understand why it's hard. Like, like, I said that wrong. It's hard, and I can't figure out how to teach it so that it makes sense. So I think it's just one of those ideas that only clicks with doing a lot of these kinds of problems, which is very unfortunate. So to Brian's question. I know we did it in lab yesterday. It's still, still vague, right? So anytime there is a phase change, I always think of this picture. This, is the, this picture is the only way that I've ever been able to get this right. Okay? And the picture is that stair step picture. right? That basically is trying to tell us that temperature versus time. right? As something heats up or cools down, there's going to be these times when the temperature is not changing. And when is that happening? When there's a phase change. When there's a change from a solid to a liquid, a liquid to a gas, a gas to a liquid. You, could, you can go directly from gas to solid and solve the gas. It's called sublimation, but don't worry about that. We're not asking you to do those edge cases, OK? But at these flat portions, OK? What we have are the latent heats, right? M, L, and there's, there's two kinds of latent heat. There's the latent heat of fusion, and then there's the latent heat of vaporization. Okay? And so here we have a melt or a freeze. And up here we have a, a boil or a um, anti-boil. So the problem, oh, okay. condensation evaporation, we didn't get into it because condensation evaporation can happen at any temperature. Boiling and freezing always happen at specific temperatures. Melting always happens at a specific temperature. But condensation evaporation, they can happen in a range of temperatures. So I can't remember what the opposite of a boil is. I thought there was a word for it, maybe not. It's not sublimation. No, sublimation. sublimation is when you go from a gas to a solid. Condensation. Yeah, I think it's condensation. It's just confusing because evaporation, condensation, they can happen. So evaporation, condensation happen when you take a shower. So it's cold right now. Uh, you know. Interior of our houses are a little bit colder. Um, the outside's cold. So when you're in that shower, right, and there's that terrible moment when you turn the water off and you need to get the towel, but the towel's outside, right? Okay. As long as you're in the shower, you feel warm, right? But as soon as you open the door, move the curtain aside, you start to feel cold. What's happening there is while you're in the shower. The air is full of these high energy hot water vapor particles. And as they condense on your skin, condensation is the act of delivering energy to the surface. Right? And so you are getting energy being dumped onto your skin as the water vapor is high energy and then has to drop its energy to become a liquid on your skin. It delivers energy to your skin. As soon as you step outside the shower, you begin evaporating water off of your skin. Evaporation is, is a cooling action. It's energy being moved away from your skin. And so you start to feel cold. The reason you start evaporating is because you've got a bunch of high energy molecules on the surface of your skin, hot water, and now they're next to cold air. And they want to go be with their higher energy brethren in the air, and so they start leaving you and you start feeling colder, right? Which is why the best thing you can do if you're cold and wet is to do what? Dry off, right? The best thing you can do is dry off because that, that slows down the rate of evaporation, okay? Um, anyway, you can, you can do this right now. You can experience this right now. Take your hand, hold it in front of your face, and don't spit on anybody, but just blow onto it. Nice and fast. What do you feel? Cold. You feel cold, okay? Why did it feel cold? What direction was energy flowing? Into or out of your hand? 
out. You felt cold, so energy was leaving your hand. Why was energy leaving your hand when you blew fast on it? High kinetic energy molecules moving really fast. The water vapor, the water on your skin, right, which is at a lower energy because it's a liquid. Some of those molecules are like, oh, that's a party up there. I want to join. And so they evaporate. And as they evaporate, they change their phase from liquid to gas, which means they had to get energy to do that. And so the energy, the surface of your hand, the average energy went down because all the ones that are about almost ready to turn into gases left. All right, same thing, but instead of a pucker up and blow, why don't you open your mouth wide and go. Now what did you feel? Now you felt warm. What happened there is the slower molecules coming deeper from your lungs, okay? Now they were slowly moving and they delivered energy to your hand. You know because it was warm. That was condensation. So evaporation, condensation, it's right there. And do you have to be at 100 degrees Celsius for either of those things to happen? No, right? So that's why evaporation condensation can be confusing terms. They can happen at any temperature. It's all about relative difference in energy. Whereas melting, freezing, and boiling always refer to specific temperature. And for water, melting and freezing happen at what temperature? Zero Celsius. 273 Kelvin. And boiling always happens at what? 100 Celsius. 393 Kelvin. Condensation... Again, there's that loose term. But to Brian's question, right, how do I set up the problems? How do I do stuff, right? In those horizontals, it's going to be M, the mass, times the latent heat constant, whatever constant it is for that particular point in the diagram, right? Uh, for water, fusion is 3.33 times 10 to the 5, and then vaporization is 2 point something times 10 to the 6. Like, it's a different constant based on which phase change you're doing. But you just go look those up in tables. The key thing is it plus or minus. Up is a plus. Depends on if you're going up or down the steps. Okay? If you're going up the steps, it's plus. Right? And by up the steps, I mean water going from ice to liquid. That's going up the steps. If you're freezing, you're making ice cubes. Then you're going down the stairs. Okay? So down the stairs is a negative, up the stairs is a positive. It's still, you still set up the equations the way I teach it by doing the sum of the delta Q's. So this could include MC delta T's for all the things that are involved in the system, but it also includes these phase changes for things that are in the system. And you just add as many terms as you need for all of those things, right? The nice thing is, is that the MC delta T's take care of themselves, don't they? You don't need to worry about positive or negative on the MC delta T. Let the delta T work itself out. It will give you a positive or negative depending on which way the temperature is changing. And where do the MC delta T's take place? On the, on the, on the slopes here, right? These are all MC delta T's, right? And all the flat sections are the ML. So in a problem like you had yesterday with the, and by the way, these went around. We send them around again, okay? I have your, 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 your laps from yesterday are in there, okay? Send them around again, right? There's more people are here now. The problem is there, right? So you can take a home study from it. When you have coffee, when you have ice, right, coming together, coffee is mostly what? Water. So it's specific to water, right? It is an empty delta T. What do you have to worry about with the ice? We, we might have to warm the ice up before we can even melt it, right? And then we got to melt it. And then now that it's melted, it's water at zero degrees Celsius. So what does that have to do? An MC delta T. So you're going to have to have MC delta T for the coffee coming down. You have to have MC delta T for the ice going up, plus phase changes that are happening. 
right? And what if the coffee started as, I don't know, steam, right? You'd have to do mz delta d of the steam, condensation, right? And then coming down. So like, you just you, you toss all of it into that sum, add it up to zero, and really the only signs you need to decide on are the latent heats. Whether it's boiling, in which case positive, condensing, negative. So on a problem like with the, the I string, whatever liquid, Okay, so yeah, so what happens if it doesn't always melt? In doing it, quote unquote, Mr. Bailo method, or my way, setting this up, if the ice doesn't melt, you'll end up with nonsensical answers. You'll end up with like a, a negative final temperature, right? Which doesn't make any sense. So if it's only partially melted, you don't need to account for even the partial amount of water that it's It depends on the question. Like if they're asking for the amount of ice that melted. You first have to establish whether or not all of it melts. But if you assume that all of it did, you plug that in, then you can use that. Yeah. Um, in chemistry, they teach this differently. And then actually, your physics textbook, they kind of teach this differently. They'll teach in the section before latent heats, they'll just be, physics textbooks will be like, add everything to zero, nice and easy. Chemistry will say Q cold E equals minus Q hot or some weirdness. Okay? And then in physics textbooks, they'll ditch all of that framework that they just taught you, and they'll say, good luck, just guess. It's essentially what they're communicating to you, because all of a sudden they'll be like, well, you got to check this, and you got to check this, and what's this case? And I'm like, don't do that. Do this. And if you get a weird answer, check your math, but if you consistently get like a negative final temperature of the system, you know that's impossible. So that tells you something. It tells you that not all of the ice melted. So now you know what the final temperature of the system is, it's zero, right? Like, use physics to help you, right, figure stuff out. So even if you do have to do the trial and error, you probably won't have to rework you still, it. You're always going to have to do trial and error with um, latent heats anyway. But you won't have to rework the problem. You don't have to rework the problem. That will be your answer because it all did melt. Well, yep, zero. yep. And if they want to know, like, the mass of ice that melted, right? You can set up another problem. Now that you know that not all of it melts and you know the final temperature is zero, you've already set it up. You can just plug in final temperatures of zero now and solve for the mass, the, the one unknown thing. You don't so have to reset up. You don't have to recycle anything. Hmm? The mass that's with the latent heat or with? Yeah, it would be the mass of the latent heat. Or, well, yeah, that's exactly what it would be. Are you going to give us tables or are you just going to tell us the latent heat diffusion? I'll tell you things. Yeah, I'm not a big table guy, but I went through the test and I tried to put constants on every question where you were going to need those constants. So this is an ideal gas law question. I've got the gas constant on there. I might have even written it in the chemistry form for you chemists out there. Um, uh, but I definitely gave it in the physics form. Um, no. If you've done this in chemistry, and if you've been doing ideal gas law the chemistry way, or, or these things, that, and you do it that way, I am not going to mark you wrong. I might be confused, but I'm not going to mark you wrong, right? Like, there's nothing wrong with the way chemists do it. But there is. <laughs> as long as your physics is still consistent, how you express it, even what direction you decide to call positive and negative, right? If you, if I can tell that you're maybe using the chemistry definitions of work and heat for thermodynamic systems and thermodynamic processes, I'm a big boy, I can handle that. It's still correct as long as you're consistent, right, with how you set the problem up. When you're writing exams, it's like anyway, right? The first pass, just write it wrong. After that, I start looking at method. Once we're in the off mode, you're right. Uh, no, I, I do a pass looking for method. You go through them twice? About three times, actually. Oh, <laughs> I do the right wrong. I go through it. I look at all the wrong answers for method, trying to give back points. And then I do a third pass that's just checking the ones that were correct to make sure you weren't cheating. And 
coming up with answers out of nowhere. That third one tends to be a little bit faster. Right answers are much easier to grade than wrong ones. Because the wrong ones, you go like, where did it go wrong here? In the exam autopsy, when I make a mistake on the exam autopsy, that's my brain just having given up on trying to check people's well, wrong. Through every exam. I can usually do all three of those passes in a couple hours. Of all the tests? Mm -hmm. Just like total time spent. I don't do it all in one sitting. Because of my brain. Yeah. For how many? And I've learned that I can't do all three of those passes per test. So like I can't just take your test, mark them all wrong, and then do a wrong pass, and then do a right pass, and then go on to the next test. Like for whatever reason, I make more mistakes doing that than just doing right wrong, and then taking the stack, and now going through the entire stack looking for wrongness, and then going through the entire stack looking for right. Like, like, the way my brain's put together, I can't hold more than two things in my head simultaneously. So like having to hold what the right answer is versus what all the problems that could like, I just, I can't, I don't know. I make fewer mistakes if I do three passes than if I do. Brain needs a I, I just, I think it's because my brain doesn't hold very many things simultaneously. Do you teach A, B, and C each semester? Uh, well, no, because we never offer A, B, and C. All the same semester, right? Okay, so, so it's, it's always a and, a and B or A and C. And so does that mean you have like a total of like what, six, six to nine hours for each correction? Um, no, so I can do, so, so you guys, Physics 4C, that's 60-ish students, right? Uh, across two sides. So I can get through all 60 in two hours. Because the right wrong one is real fast. Yeah. I can go through the whole stack in less than 10 minutes. Right, and then the one the long pass is the the wrong pass. Right, what went wrong here? Are your A and C semesters less stressful than your A and B? No, why? <laughs> B is ruthless. Um, look, B is fun. What are you talking about? No, B is ruthless. <laughs> <laughs> I remember. I still remember twenty six years later <laughs> how bad physics for B was. Um, but yeah, teaching. No, the, the 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 hard the harder one to teach is the is the two series, the two A and two B. Isn't that just kind of like a what? What? What major requires a No, um, you can't hide behind math in the two series. It's, a, it's there's more concept in the two series and a little bit less math, but they don't like that level and those students. They're not like as fast when it comes to picking up on geometries and all that kind of stuff, right? Um, they just aren't. They're coming out of like, they know their trig really well, because they probably just came out of trig or something like that. But like calculus, like I can hide behind calculus in 4B really easy. Like I can make teaching that class really easy. I choose not to. The hardest class to teach is physical science 11, which is the all concept class. That is the hardest for teachers. Because you can't, there's, there's hardly any math for you to hide behind. You just have to make them understand. I can't make anybody do anything. <laughs> what I can do is cajole and beg and uh, cheerlead and all of those things. But I've never heard of cajole. I, the, the physical science 11 students ask the best questions. I'm sorry to say, you guys really don't ask the best questions. Okay? Because the physical science students are coming from left field. Right? Like way out there in left field. They're English majors and philosophy majors and art majors and music majors. And so their questions become like existential really quick. <laughs> right? And like, how is this physics helping my life? And you really, as a teacher, have to be able to hit a lot of different thought patterns. And here, we're all nerds and geeks and uh, engineering majors. We kind of sort of, I don't want to say we all think the same way, but there's a, there's a scientific method to our thinking. For the physical science level students. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, right. <yeah. laughs> what does it mean to be a triangle? <laughs> you imagine doing projectile motion without the toolbox? No. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> right? That's how you that's physical science eleven. No toolbox, but you still gotta teach them about projectile motion. 
Yeah, yeah, no, you, 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 like I said, you can do it, but I'm telling you, it's the hardest class to teach. By far and away, the conceptual level courses are the hardest ones to teach. Everybody thinks it's the other way around. It's not. When you have math as, as a language to express it, it's much easier. Much easier. Anyway, we're not, we're off topic here. What is, you guys don't want to know about teaching pedagogy or philosophy. What are your questions about? Or maybe you do, maybe you don't want to think about thermodynamics anymore. <laughs> I think it means we have a good Does it? I'll find out on Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just for a warning in general, scores go down on this exam. Like, the first exam is kind of high, this one scores go down, people start feeling depressed, whatever. <laughs> The third exam, the scores kind of bump up a little bit, sort of, I don't know, it's kind of in between the first and second exams in terms of scores. And then the fourth exam is a, it's a capture, it's a quantum mechanics, so who knows what's going on? The second one's the one I passed. Yeah. <laughs> so. Could you do number two again? Yeah. Could you do number seven on chapter 19? As long as it doesn't have a heat pump refrigerator in it. Oh, well, this should be one that you guys have access to the key for, so I don't have to uh, hide anything. Uh, uh, it's the one with Roji D, never mind. What's that? It's the one with Roji D. Oh, the depth of the thing? The bubble. Yeah, yeah, the bubble. <laughs> so you still want to see it or not? No. I had trouble because I forgot to convert the atmospheres to... To Pascal's. Pascal's. Yeah. Always do everything in, in standard standard units. Yeah. I do my best. Some problems are written in imperial units and it will always give you a conversion vector. But we're supposed to know the the conversion formulas they don't give you. The conversion factor I'll give you. This number is this number in this unit system. But yeah, like a, a ten, that's a conversion equation. What is the zero again? The zeroth law is about uh, thermal equilibrium. What does it mean for something to be in thermal equilibrium? If they're the same temperature, right? Okay. So, so the zeroth law. I gave you the, the the ancient, the original form of it. If block A and block B are in thermal equilibrium, and then block C is touching both blocks, what can you conclude? And they're in therm and it's in thermal equilibrium. What can you conclude? A, B, and C all at the same time. So, so the modern version is. Thermal equilibrium, like temperature, okay, as a measure of the state of a system, and you can infer that when things are temp in thermal equilibrium, that the temperatures are the same. Yeah. I maybe just kind of went over explaining like the latent fusion stuff, but do you mind doing an example problem from the homework? We can't. Do you have one for me? Yeah. So I number three on chapter eighteen. Okay, so we're back, we're back to coffee again. This has been a theme, right? It's the hardest thing to quit. <laughs> it is, really. So, usually the problem with this problem was the answer because they're not asking for the final temperature of the system. They're asking for how much it cooled. The difference between starting and final is what they're asking for. But anyway, let's let's set up the problem, right? Yeah. All right. So here's our problem, and 
we know a we know that we've got coffee and it's less than its boiling point so that no phase change there um, we know that the ice cube starts at what temperature Zero degrees Celsius because it's at its melting point. Um, and then they want us to get the basically the final temperature of the system and based how much the temperature dropped. Okay. So let me just kind of draw my little thing right here, right? Okay. We're we're starting right here and then we're meeting somewhere in the middle, right? And the, the coffee is coming down and the ice is going up. So I'm going to write zero equals and then I'm going to start writing out all the things that can be changing temperature and changing phase, right? So I've got mass of the coffee, specific heat of water, change in temperature of my coffee. That's the coffee coming down, right? And then the ice, I've got the melting of the ice, so I'm going to use latent heat of fusion, and I'm going to put a plus sign on it. Why a plus sign? It's melt. I'm going up the stairs, right? And then I have to also take into consideration that once the ice melts, the mass that once was ice is now water going through a temperature change of its own. What was that? It starts at zero. Oh, yeah. We don't have to change the temperature of the ice. Right. Yeah. So there we go. So what do we got here? We got, um, and, you know, at this point, I would just throw numbers in. Uh, we've got uh, mass of the coffee, 0. 0.160. So how did I do that? I just did like three steps right in my head. A cubic centimeter is a milliliter, and the density of water is one gram per cubic centimeter, one gram per milliliter. And so if I have 160 cubic centimeters, I have 160 grams. And 160 grams is 0.16 kilograms. Uh, 4,186. And then the coffee. Uh, final temperature, don't know, started at 86. 86. Okay. And then mass of my ice, 16 grams of ice. Oh, well, that's, that's a nasty number to give me because it's 0 0.160 for one of them and 0 0.016 for the other. So in my brain, those are the same number. Uh, latent heat of fusion of ice is 3.33 uh, times 10 to the fifth. That's one I've used so often, it just stuck. Plus uh, mass of the ice, 0 0.016, uh, specific heat of water, 4,186. Uh, don't know the final temperature, but started at zero degrees. Come, you know, so it's, it's coming up from there, right? And now I've got to solve for a final temperature. I really don't want to. Because there's just a lot of numbers everywhere now. Okay. But let's say that the final temperature ends up being, I don't know, 60 degrees. And you go and put 60 degrees into this problem, you will get it wrong. Because that's not what the problem asked for. Problem asked for how many degrees did your coffee cool? So if your coffee started at 86 and got to 60, how much did it cool? 26 degrees. That was the answer that they wanted. Will I do that to you on the exam? No. No. You should. Who's that one guy that said you should? Because that's just. This is why I say thermodynamics is dumb. It's not just thermodynamics. Physics textbook authors do this everywhere. They do. They did it in conservation of energy too. To you in four A. Apparently, for some reason, they didn't think it was hard enough, so they had to ask stupid questions, what I consider to be very dumb questions, right? Um, in tricky ways, like, like, I don't mind the question of how much did the coffee cool down by? 
solve for the final temperature, and then take the div, like giving you instructions specifically about what they want. I have no problem with, right? But I have a problem with them as being, oh, let's trick the student, right? And fool, you know, and frustrate the student so that. No. We're not in the business of frustrating you. Physics is hard enough. Don't need to be doing stuff like that. But apparently, thermodynamics is hard enough. Apparently, the textbooks, the uh, makers are invested in shake stock or something. Yeah, or. Stock. No, <laughs> it, 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 it's less nefarious than that, and maybe even worse in some ways. They do it this way because this is the way it's always been done. Um, why change system when system not broke? System is broke. Yeah. Very broke. But if they ignore it, uh, <laughs> I am a part of that system, and I work very hard to always be warning you and saying, ah, oh, this is where the trend kept right. I'm doing my best. I am doing my best. I'm trying. It takes a while to oh, change like that out of the system. Takes decades. Yeah. And I want you to know the rate of change of innovation in physics textbooks has picked up in my career. I started my career um, screaming and yelling about how bad textbooks were, and the needle has shifted. And if you guys just have like, I've seen my dad's old it's, like, it's just like a wall of text. Yeah, like it's almost, terrible. Um, it's like the brand like, of like education. I had somebody, a friend of mine's son, came home for Christmas. He's like, "Your name's in my physics textbook." I'm like, yeah. and sure enough, the textbook that they were using at their university was a textbook that I had given feedback for. I, I do these, publishers will contact me and say, hey, will you give us your opinion on the textbook? I'm like, yes, definitely, because the text is wrong. And, um, and um, <laughs> some, one of the textbook, I think, oh, that's right. I, I remember what happened. The chief editor for this physics textbook lived about three blocks that way. This is like a national, like internationally known textbook. The chief editor for it was like, lived right over there, right? And I found out. Right, that she lived because because the chief editor would show up here, and I'm like, what are you doing here? This is Fresno City College. Nobody knows about us, right? She's like, well, I, I live right there in the power district. I'm like, really, right? And so we would go out to lunch and talk physics and all this kind of stuff. So she snuck my name into the credits, right? Because I told her several things about how to read the book, and she thought it was good. She said, and so the student had read the credits of the book. Open the front page, and there's like a thousand names. And he saw my name, and he's like, Is that you? I was like, Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but there isn't a physics textbook out there right now that's like a major, even a lot of the minor ones that I haven't given people. Have you signed my No, I not. <laughs> You haven't worn that shirt with a picture of you in quite a while. Which picture? The one that they got you. The shirt, you know, that. Oh, yeah. Did you wear it on exam day? Yeah, I'll wear it on exam day. Okay. Because I wear my mask during exams because when you guys are asking me questions, it's always like. <laughs> you know each other's personal space. The mask gives me the illusion of my own personal space. So for future reference, are you going to ixnay the reverse Carnot on any question just because of the weird word? I'm not going to ixnay it. I gave you the solution. Okay. It's on the PDF, and it's now on the YouTube. So you can just go see how it's done and be done with it in five minutes. But don't worry about how to do it. Not your question. Yeah. Other questions? Apparently, Ant-Man and the Wasp. Quantumania or whatever it is is not doing well uh, among critics. The the review embargo has lifted, and so the critics it's had like a fifty seven percent Rotten Tomato score, um, and then which means it'll probably make like six seven billion dollars, right? Because fans and critics never see eye to eye anymore about movies. Yeah. So so but here's here's the problem. Several of the critics mentioned, if you guys have an actual physics question, you should ask it, because otherwise I'm just going to start talking about Marvel movies. Um, 
so interrupt me. The um, more than one critic said it's the second worst Marvel film of all time. What was the first? Eternals. Yeah. So, so if they're making comparisons between the Eternals and this movie, that is not good. Not good. So I guess I'll be waiting for Disney Plus on that one too. <laughs> it's supposed to be the reboot for Phase Five, King the Conqueror. Like this is a major storyline in the comic books. No, I know. That's important, but. Yeah. James Gunn defected to DC, so I've got it. All right, you can uh, stay and ask me questions if you want. Otherwise, I think we're done. So I will see you Tuesday for an exam.